Hello everyone and welcome to Art Game Viking. This is the second video in my series on the earliest large-scale conflicts between Native Americans and European colonists in North America. The subject of today's video is the Pequot War and the making of colonial New England. So, like uh, most of my videos, I like to point out that uh, whenever we hear of the names of regions or countries or provinces like, say, China or England or New England, uh, we, of course, in our modern world, tend to think of how these regions, countries, slash provinces, etc. are um, in our modern world itself. Uh, and this is, of course, as always, not uh, incorrect or inaccurate. However, it is also not the full picture. These regions, countries, provinces, etc., became the, the shape that they are through a series of very gradual processes and events. And so, in order to better understand how these regions, countries, provinces, etc. became the way they are today, we have to go back in time a little bit further to get the full picture. Yeah. Which leads us to the first section of this video, Native American tribes and New England before European colonization. So, uh, before and also a little bit a little bit during uh, European colonization, uh, New England and the northeastern woodlands of North America was home to a large number of very diverse tribal nations and entities with uh, many of these tribes being divided, uh, much like the Powhatan Confederacy in the, that was mentioned in the first video, divided into types of government based off of things like great councils and confederacies, i.e. Uh, various uh, tribal nations that have allied together to make a bigger nation with uh, the importance of Mother Nature taking uh, the utmost importance and other cultural uh, characteristics being things like uh, matrilineal and matrifocal systems because unlike Europe and Asia and large parts, though not all of Africa, Native American culture in North America and really through all of the Americas uh, by and large tends to mostly be based off of uh, matrilineal and matrifocal systems, with a matrilineal system being a system where uh, women control property, um, hereditary status is passed, and, and hereditary status is passed through the mothers, i.e. whereas in our modern Euro-American um, and Asian uh, worlds, uh, the lineage is traced through our fathers, and we'd like, say, for example, take on our father's last name, um, the exact opposite was done in Native American culture, um, with the lineage uh, being traced through the mothers, and if there was a last name, it would be passed through the mother's last name. Uh, and then matrifocal being the idea that when a young couple married, uh, the couple would live with the woman's family, and women elders could approve selections of chiefs or uh, sachems, also known as sachems. I've heard it pronounced both ways, uh, which again is the exact opposite of how it was done in Euro American Euro American culture. Also, women uh, path would tend to would be the ones who would pass plots of land to their female descendants, regardless of marital status. So. Again, i.e., uh, the exact opposite of European culture. And tribes and tribal nations in the northeastern woodlands around New England and other parts of North America uh, would live in large scale villages uh, in 
what what one could argue is essentially log cabins, uh, long birch bark cabins. Of course, something that I've run into as a historian working in museums and, and such involving Native Americans, I have often run into people tend to think that all Native Americans lived, for example, in teepees. Of course, that's the farthest from the truth. Actually, by and large, uh, most Native Americans tend to live in uh, sedentary villages like that sort of looked something like this. And here's an example of the long birch bark uh, longhouses, as they were often called. Uh, and these tribes and tribal nations did utilize agriculture, having large-scale agricultural fields, both within the limits of their towns and villages and cities, but also with, outside of them as well, with uh, the with primary crops being things like beans and squash and corn, though they would also uh, harvest and make use of uh, uh, food sources found in forests that they would cultivate uh, to their needs using controlled fires where they would collect things like uh, black walnuts, butternuts, chestnuts, hickory nuts, etc., uh, as well as sap, uh, and they would also boil things into soups like wild rice and blueberries and acorns. Uh, maple syrup would be the sap that I mentioned. <clears throat> They would, of course, also hunt as well, hunting a variety of, of animals, uh, such as deer that you can see here, but also turkey, wild turkeys, uh, other types of waterfowl like ducks, uh, bears, etc. And they would also make use of marine food sources, such as fish, constructing uh, either using spear fishing, using nets like you see here, or constructing what are known as fishing weirs, where you build a fence or a rock wall that sort of circles around like this, with the entrance being entrance being wide like this, and then sort of tapering out on the other end like this, uh, which would prevent fish from escaping. Um, with marine food, uh, marine food sources that were utilized, including but not being limited to things like eels, uh, crawfish or crayfish, um, depending on the region of America you're from, oysters and clams, and various types of Atlantic fish such as herring, uh, blueback, uh, sorry, blueback herring or Atlantic herring, uh, shad, uh, or alewife, and uh, lobster as well. The tribes of uh, the northeastern woodlands around New England and other parts also had access to a very widespread and highly developed trade network where they would trade for things like copper from the Great Lakes, uh, ceremonial pipes, as well as the stone that the pipes were made of, made out of, so called pipe stone, as well as uh, types of marine shells that would be woven into belts uh, that had particular designs that was essentially a type of writing because each design meant a specific thing called wampum. And this leads us to the Pequot. So the Pequot were one of the uh, preeminent and most powerful tribes uh, in the part of modern-day New England that would consist of Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts, uh, with the Pequot and their um, related tribe, the Mohegans, not to be mistaken for Mohegans, uh, which is the Mohawk, uh, having uh, migrated into this area by around 1500 CE slash AD. Uh, and by the time of the event, by 1600, uh, the Pequot would have uh, a large uh, territory with at least two dozen large villages slash cities within it. Uh, and they would um, be one of the most powerful rivals of other tribes, such as the Wampanoag and the Narragansett. Uh, which now leads us to European 
the European colonization of New England uh, in 16, between 1620 and 1636 CE. So the first European power to attempt to settle the New England area um, in the very early 1600s would, was the Dutch Republic, which would settle, uh, uh, start settling New England uh, in, or what they would call New Netherland in 1614, building several forts over the course of um, a 40-year time span. Uh, building and these forts would include uh, cities slash forts such as Fort Nassau, of course, New Amsterdam itself, um, is and then uh, Hemstede, uh, etc., etc. But uh, the uh, European power that had the most, the largest effect on the Pequot by far was the British Empire, which. Uh, began to had already begun in the in 1607 colonizing the Americas, but would really begin to see large scale migrations to North America in the 1620s, with over 20,000 uh, British citizens migrating to New England alone in 1620 leading to the establishment of the first British colony, the colony of Plymouth in 1620 uh, CE, and shortly followed in 1630 by the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, here. And of course, uh, Plymouth Colony uh, and its relationship with the Native Americans on the... It, in New England is very well known for the idea of the first Thanksgiving, which I've already done a dedicated video to, which I'll link into in the iCard, uh, and of course was not at all what we tend to think of, <laughs> what the myth tells, it, it tells us it is uh, in the modern day. Uh, shortly after the Dutch and the British uh, creations of these colonies, Plymouth, uh, Massachusetts Bay, New Netherlands, uh, the fur trade would begin to be established within New England with uh, the Pequot and other Native American tribes fighting for dominance over the fur trade because much like the Powhatans in Virginia, uh, the Native Americans of New England were the ones who generally held the upper hand and the monopoly of the fur trade. They were the ones who would go out and hunt these furs, uh, most uh, sought after being beaver, but other furs like deer, to be traded to the British in return for tools such as flintlock muskets and uh, metal cooking and implements and, uh, and other implements like you see here. Which leads us to the causes of what would eventually become the Pequot War. <clears throat> so one of the early grievances that would eventually lead to the outbreak of the Pequot War was uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony becoming a major stronghold for the production of wampum, uh, which is wampum is... Um, are marine shells that carved into beads uh, that are most commonly woven into belts, again, with those specific designs that mean specific things. Again, it's a type of writing, but also can be woven into necklaces and things like that. And this was originally an industry that both the Narragansett and Pequots held a monopoly on until the 1630s CE. So, of course, this led to increased tensions between the Narragansetts and the Pequots and the Massachusetts Bay Colony. <laughs> Not to mention the already the competition between the Pequots and the Narragansetts that already existed within the fur trade. Another major factor uh, was a, a famine that happened due to the destruction caused by what is known as the Great Colonial Hurricane of 1635, which 
destroyed a lot of farmland in the Massachusetts Bay Colony itself, but destroyed far more agricultural and farmland within the Pequot's uh, area of control, and therefore leading to more increased tensions between the Pequot and the Massachusetts Bay Colony and other colonies. And then all of this would come to an head when the Narragansetts, who had already been competing with the Pequot for you know, the wampum industry as well as the fur industry, among others, uh, would, uh, or at least it's, it's assumed because it's still up for debate who actually did the killing, uh, but the most likely scenario is the Narragansett. Uh, eventually, the Narragansett, due to this competition, would kill British trader John Oldman, uh, and then would eventually blame it on the Pequot, which in, its, in, in itself led to the Pequot War. So before we go into the course of the Pequot War itself, uh, we need to take a look at the general makeup, uh, ha generally what the Pequot warriors uh, of this time would have looked like, and the makeup of their weapons. So Pequot warriors generally look like you would see here with higher ranking uh, warriors like Sockums and war chiefs uh, looking generally like this with uh, predominantly Pequot uh, lower ranking Pequot warriors tending to look like something like this. Um, this is actually a Narragansett uh, individual, but the Narragansett and Pequot generally had the, the dressed uh, very similarly for war. Uh, and the Pequot uh, had a variety of weapons at their disposal uh, for close up combat, hand to hand combat. They had weapons like uh, mace like war clubs or uh, more sword shaped war clubs that would either have, uh, that would, uh, would always be in this shape, but would either have a hard wooden edge along this area here or would have one metal uh, spike here or sometimes had several metal or chert spikes along the edge making it a very effective close range weapon. Uh, they also still used the bow and arrow to, to varying degrees because of course the bow and arrow had a better firing rate than muskets, uh, was generally more accurate and could still cause quite a lot of damage uh, despite being slightly less powerful than a musket. Though with that in mind, the Pequot did have access uh, and did utilize flintlock muskets as well. This is a musket of the Dutch design, which was generally the most common type of musket in New England. Uh, now we need to go look at the British soldiers. Uh, so generally this is what a British soldier would have sort of looked like in the 1600s CE, uh, with some wearing uh, metal helmets, uh, while others just simply wearing hats. And the weapons that they utilized were a variety of uh, flintlock pistols, like you see here, and of course the same general flintlock muskets that was utilized were utilized by the Pequot, albeit of course they were of British design, not Dutch design, uh, and they would use for up-close hand-to-hand combat uh, daggers as well as sabers like you see here. They would also use to great effect against Pequot uh, boats and canoes, cannons, at least a couple of times in the course of the war. All right, so with the makeup, uh, with, with the general look of the uh, military forces as well as the weapons they use out of the way, it's time to take a look at the course of the Pequot War itself. So at the onset of the Pequot War, in response to the killing of John Oldman, the British would ally with the Narragansett and Mohegan tribes against the Pequot. Remember, while the Pequot and Mohegan were related and did migrate to the region together, at this point in time they had become separate entities. Uh, once securing these alliances, 
the Massachusetts Bay Colony would then put John Endicott in charge of an attack against the Pequot who resided on Block Island, an attack that failed and was repulsed by, uh, by the Pequot warriors. After that, the Pequot would successfully raid English several English settlements uh, in Massachusetts and Connecticut uh, and Rhode Island also, I believe, uh, before successfully besieging and sacking Fort Saybrook uh, throughout the Ottoman winter of 1636 and 1637 CE. In response to these successful raids and the destruction uh, that resulted from these raids, uh, the Connecticut River colonies would put John Mason uh, in charge of a force consisting of 110 colonial militia, 200 Narragansetts, and 70 Mohegan warriors under so you know, Sockham or Sachem Uncas here. And here's, of course, John Mason. And they would begin to march towards uh, a Pequot fort known as the Village of Mystic or Mystic Fort, where uh, John Mason and the Narragansett and Mohegan warriors would then proceed to uh, wait till the Pequot were asleep and then would surround the village and sneak in and set fire to the village and slaughter the Pequot uh, to the last man, woman, and child. A very horrible and brutal event. In fact, it was so brutal that according to one of the other commanders, uh, John Underhill, in his uh, uh, News from America or New and uh, Experimental Discovery of New England, uh, he talks about how once they committed this brutal, started committing this brutal massacre, that their uh, Native American allies actually came to them uh, and, and, as he put it, cried, uh, mock it, mock it, uh, which essentially means that it, it is not, it is not, because it is too furious and slays too many men, i.e. the British tactics were far too brutal uh, compared to the typical tactics that the Pequots or Narragansett or Mohegans would have done. However, uh, due to, uh, after voicing their disapproval, uh, the British would essentially say, well, do you want us to do it to you as well? Um, and then also, uh, while they were trying to leave, uh, other Pequot war bands would prevent the uh, Indian allies from leaving as well essentially forcing them to continue to help the colonists with their uh, brutal genocidal tactics because there's just no way around it. That was a, This was a genocide. Upon hearing upon, about this victory, uh, Governor John Winthrop of the Massachusetts Bay Colony would declare a thanksgiving in honor of the victory uh, the slaughter and massacre over the Pequot at Mystic Fort on June 3rd of 1637 CE. You can see it right here, uh, just in plain English right there. Again, I've already done a video on the history of Thanksgiving revolving around these massacres. I will link it in the iCard. After this victory at Mystic Fort, uh, the Pequot would essentially have their spirit broken, and their uh, most influential Sachem slash Sachem, uh, Sasakus, uh, would lead uh, the roughly four hundred, uh, the roughly four hundred remaining warriors and refugees of the Pequot along the coast to seek refuge with the Mohawk tribe um, to the northwest, but only to be caught up, uh, only for John Mason to catch up with them and defeat Sasakus and the his Pequot warriors um, at Fairfield Swamp, 
uh, in an event that would eventually become known as the Fairfield Swamp Fight, officially ending the Pequot War. Which brings us to the aftermath of the war itself. So, immediately after the end of the Pequot War, a treaty known as the Treaty of Hartford would be signed by New England, the Mohegan, and the Narragansett. Uh, with the remaining, <coughs> excuse me, the remaining Pequot prisoners being divided between tribes with an unspecified number of captives being kept by New England colonists. Uh, with the idea that the Pequot would be extinct, um, and I'll also get into a minute, that's not actually what happened, uh, and Pequot town and settlements were no longer allowed, uh, <laughs> but it's also important to note that uh, the Massachusetts Bay colonists uh, who were part of the alliance uh, did not receive, was not a party of the Treaty of Hartford. Uh, Connecticut was the was the primary benefactor of this treaty. And the treaty is actually uh, talked about in depth by John Mason himself in his uh, brief history of the Pequot War, uh, where he says, as you can see here, uh, that essentially the Pequots were bound by covenant that none should inhabit their native country, nor should any of them be called Pequots anymore but uh, Mohegs or Narragansett forever. Um, and shortly after, about 40 of them went to the Mohegans and et, et cetera, et cetera. You know, again, they're in plain English. Uh, while many Pequots were divided between the, uh, 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 the colony of Connecticut as well as the Mohegan and Narragansett, a large number of other Pequots were enslaved and shipped off to Bermuda uh, or the West Indies or were forced to become uh, household servants and were enslaved by English households in Connecticut and the Massachusetts Bay colonies. And you can see sort of what uh, that scene might have looked like here. Uh, and here is a map of sort of of what the tribal territory would have looked like and the New England settlements looked like uh, in 1639, just two years after the Pequot War ended. And this in itself would lead to, for the most part, a period of 38 years of peace between Native Americans and British colonists uh, before uh, war would eventually broke out uh, would break out again in King Philip's War, a conflict that was hev that would be heavily influenced by the brutality of uh, the British forces against the Pequot in the Pequot War. Now that leads us to the last section of the video, the Pequot today. So, despite the attempts from the Massachusetts Bay and Connecticut and Connecticut colonies. Uh, the Pequot were not exterminated and are not extinct because, uh, so let me, let me phrase it, they were, they were no longer a political entity, but they still held the, their cultural identity. Uh, and that cultural identity was able to uh, survive in the Mohegan and Narragansett tribes with the descendants of the Pequot being able to eventually reform into the now federally recognized Pequot nation. Uh, with individuals from that nation being seen in these photos here and here. And as you can see, their culture is still alive and well, despite uh, previous attempts by the British to wipe them out and destroy their culture and cultural identity, as well as despite continued, and I want to emphasize that, continued attempts by the United States government to uh, wipe out the culture and cultural identity of Native Americans as a whole, including the Pequot. 
All right, so that brings an end to the second video in my series on the earliest uh, large-scale conflicts between Native Americans and European colonists in North America. Uh, if you, I hope you enjoyed the video, uh, and if you want to see me cover any of the subjects I mentioned in the video in greater detail and other video, later videos, uh, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section. And remember to like, share, and subscribe, and I hope you all have a good day.